Greetings, everyone. So nice to be here in Santiago, one of my favorite countries in the world. My name is Johnny Kovacevic, and I'm the first person to drive across America in an electric car to do my book tour. I drove 13,000 kilometers to show the people that the future is now. I'm also a scientist, and I take the traditional definition of the word. It's a dynamic process of individual enlightenment. And what I'm going to do for you today is enlighten you on the umbilical cord of human progress, which is energy. Energy is changing for many reasons. We have to deal with pollution. We've seen this in the big cities. In Santiago, you have your own issues, and these things will be addressed. And I'm going to show you、uh, your role in this pivot. We also have the technology, which is now caught up. It is commercially viable. When I studied these things in the early 1990s, they were pretty much fairy tales, but today they work. They really do. I followed it for 20 years. I've invested 20,000 hours studying these themes, and I can tell you that you, as the consumer, are going to have a tremendous benefit in the years to come. With respect to climate change and big oil and the fossil fuel companies, these are the seven sisters. When John D. Rockefeller had to、um, take apart Standard Oil, these companies were put in place, and they've had a strong influence on global politics, industry, consumerism. This is changing. We're now at a pivot point, and I'm going to show you how we see it. We always look at this cartoon where people think that big oil is controlling things, including why do we not have electric cars? All these years, if the electric car is so good, why don't we have them sooner? It's a good question. So, to understand the automotive business, you have to understand the automobile. There are over 6,000 individual parts in the average internal combustion engine. We agree. There is the beautiful picture of a Ferrari from the 1930s. And if you want to talk that argument, how big oil and the automotive industry are together, you need to look at a country that does not have a petroleum endowment. I speak of Germany. We all know German cars. We all know that, or you should know, that it's the most important industry in Germany. And not on top of that, they don't have a petroleum endowment. Look at these companies here. I'm familiar with them. Let me take them away and show you what they make. They make cranks, pistons, valves, radiators, mufflers, gaskets, belts, chains. Now, if you have an electric car, how many of these things are used?、Uh, you speak English, ma'am. Yes. Are you an automotive engineer? Are you an automotive engineer? <laughs> how many mufflers? In an electric car, zero, not one. If you're a corporation that makes mufflers, how do you embrace an industry that doesn't use your product? There are two ways to make an automobile. There's the old way, and the new way. Remember, six to seven thousand individual parts. The electric car has 25 major components. Dramatic difference on how this business is being changed. I will tell you that it's been turned on its head. If you look at this picture of the baby, this is an analogy. What keeps the automotive industry awake at night is not a giant baby crushing cars in the streets of New York. No, it's that technology, the startup company, and they've seen this movie played before. If you don't incubate the baby, the, the new technology, it's the very thing that ends up eating you. We've seen this happen before. They're well aware. Big tech. Is increasingly the most important thing in global industry. Don't forget this. They've seen the movie play out, where、uh, Blockbuster Video could have invested in Netflix. Kodak Film Company invented the digital camera. BlackBerry the smartphone. We've seen this happen, and these technology companies become humongous in only a short number of years. There are only 14 companies that control the global automotive industry. All these are their brands. You, you recognize them for sure. That's it. But they have a problem. Big tech is coming, and they have to either be a victim or a contrarian. But my friends, who is the collateral damage in this transition? 
Yeah, oil. Who's the biggest customer of the oil business? Transportation. Sir, you don't need to buy oil. What you and your family need is transportation, and transportation is what you're going to get. If we look in 2006, the world's largest companies, the biggest, consistently oil and gas. If I go back 100 years and I show you a list of the world's largest corporation, consistently will be five or six oil and gas companies. Let's go to today. Not one. Not one. I cannot underline this enough. Big oil, big auto, big insurance, big advertising, they are all subordinate to big technology. This time, it is different. They are far wealthier. They have far more money. They have far more customers in the billions, and typically, they're green. People are very negative on the electric car. In 2009, there were 6,000 electric cars on global roads. Fast forward to last year, 1.2 million. That's a pretty good move. Yeah, growth business? I think so. I will suggest to you in the next three or four years, there will be over 10 million electric cars on global roads. But the thing to focus on is my blue arrow. Cars, buses, transport vehicles that operate 18 hours a day. They are punitive when they stop using oil. Remember that, my friends. This is where the focus will be, and the main country for this drive will be the country of China. The trip I took across America looks like this. All the red dots that you're looking at are the charging stations of Tesla. I never had a problem. This is the future of how it works. They built this system in about three years, so it didn't take very long. If you look at the old model, you find the oil, you move it, you refine it, you move it, and you sell it as a product. This is an absurd business model. Oil is a very precious product. I understand that. We can make enhanced products. All the plastic in your life, all the rubber, all the polyester, this is what we should use oil for, and this is where the future of that business is going. I will suggest this very strongly. My gas station is a cable made of copper. I charge my car, and I do it very happily. You will see these things. They will be installed in the tens of millions in the coming years. Remember this, my friends. They will be installed in the tens of millions, wherever you park a car. To give you context, there are 150,000 gas stations in America, and that number will continue to fall and fall. Who's going to pay for all this? Well, the, the big guys. Volkswagen, GM, Ford, all of them, because they have a bigger problem. Not only are young people not driving, especially in the United States and America, they're not even getting their driver's license. They will never be a customer. They use Uber, ride-sharing, car-sharing, and they typically are green, and they're constantly told that when you buy an electric car, you're charging it with electricity made from coal. You've heard this before? This is false. I tell my friends, these scientists, and I say, where is your statistics? Where did you learn this information? It's maybe 10 years old. They're wrong. In this is how we're going to charge cars in the future. These things work now. And when I say for the statistics, let me show you. They were wrong. How wrong could they have been? Look at the black. 30% of America's electricity is derived from coal. How shall they cite the minority fuel source? This will continue to fall. In the next four or five years, coal will only be 20% of America's electricity. So how can he save the coal miners of West Virginia and Kentucky? You can mine all the thermal coal you wish. You just have no one to sell it to. It's all about the money. They've converted a lot of the power plants to natural gas, and it's not coming back. Distant future will be other forms of renewable energy. I suggest to people that innovation, adoption, technology are the death knell, the, the muerta blow of the oil and gas industry. To understand oil is a very complicated thing. 
You see, I've studied oil for 20 years, and I read it like a, like a romance novel. I enjoy these things. But it's a very boring subject. So if I'm going to stimulate the imagination of these two young men, I'm going to make you an expert in oil in the next three minutes. Let's have some fun. The industry is pivoting, and some people are waiting for a high price of oil. By a show of hands, is everyone aware that the price of oil collapsed in the last two years? OK, you know this. OK, and there's many reasons why. We currently use 96 million barrels of oil each day. OK, and that oil is used for basically three major things. 55% of the oil is used for transportation. The other 45% is used for enhanced products, plastics, rubbers, and making electricity. Okay? So going forward in the future, this is a prognostication. No one knows, no one can tell you exactly what will take place to the future. Follow the ball. See the blue ball? We have two probabilities here. The line we're looking at is the demand, the usage of oil from 1900 till today. It's not scientific. It's a very, forgive the boredom of there. But here's our two probabilities. Demand will continue, like the experts told us before, or it will start to go into what's called decline. I cannot articulate this enough. In my opinion, with 20,000 hours of research, we are now entering the, the slow, gradual, it's still important, decline in the world's oil demand. There are positive factors and negative factors why the price of oil shall go higher in price. The main reason that oil will be expensive is politics. That's the only real driver. If you have bad politics in sensitive areas, the price of oil can go higher. It can go much higher for a while. Because it's a, it's a scale of value. In the short term, markets are voting machines. People vote, but in the long run, they are weighing machines. The true value of any product, of any service, always manifests itself. Because of innovation, adoption, technology, we have now entered what I call decline. When you innovate, you use less oil. When you adopt, you use no oil. And when you incorporate technology into the whole equation, it's a game changer. For 100 years, this is how we used to drill for oil. Vertical wells. You drill down, you enter the area where the oil is, and you bring it to the surface. You've heard of fracking, and if not, this is what fracking is. They've invented a new way of drilling. What they do is they drill the hole, and they go sideways, up to three kilometers. This is like reinventing the wheel in the oil business. This is why America now has oil independence. This is why people around the world don't want a higher oil price, because it makes more and more and more of this oil possible. We can extract more oil. So there are two variables, the supply of oil, and we as consumers, the demand of oil. This is what will take place. More times than not, you will have more supply than demand. This is what my research is telling me, and this is how I understand it. Yeah? Can oil go back up to $100? Maybe. But in the long run, I think we will have more supply than demand. So then we can realistically look at this question. Have we entered the beginning of the end of the oil age? Let's not take my word for it. Let's look at the experts. What are they saying? The three most important letters in the oil business are MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, the young deputy crown prince of Saudi Arabia. He's 32 years old. He has the most important position in Saudi Arabia, and he is pivoting the Saudi economy from oil to electrification. It's called Vision 2030. Take a look here. What he will do there, he will take some of the oil money from um, uh, uh, Saudi oil profits, and he will reinvest this into technology, components, his people, education. And that means electricity. That's where we're going with this. He's been left with two choices. 
These are his two options. Staticville, where nothing changes, or Progressville. Let's frame it a different way. He can choose to be a victim, because that's what happens if you don't progress, or he can choose to be a contrarian. He must think differently. He has no choice. What's Chile's vision 2030? What's your role in the next 15 years? Shall we not make a vision 2030 for the country of Chile? I think that's an important question, because everyone in this room lives inside this box. It's very important what I'm suggesting here. If the world is telling us that the fat man of fossil fuels shall go on a diet, then you must live in this box. You must understand that oil is energy. Energy without the use of fossil fuels is electricity, and electricity demands copper. Design, engineering. We need to inspire a generation of our young people into STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, math, and it all starts with your main export, cobre. This is an irreplaceable component in the future of energy. It's a remarkable product. And by the way, it's infinitely recyclable. Moses didn't throw his copper away. Julius Caesar did not throw his copper away. Napoleon Bonaparte did not throw his copper away. And to this very day, if you throw your copper away, you are a fool. This is an incredible product. What can we do with copper? Let me explain. When you build a wind park of energy, it takes 500% more copper. Solar power, 400 to 600% more copper. If I want to make things more energy efficient, that means use less electricity in the first place. You have to add copper, transformers, motors, windings, connection points. The fabrication of copper is going to be one of the most important things in the global economy. If you want to leave a business for your grandchildren, and I'm speaking of you, young gentlemen, for your grandchildren, that business will be copper, but things made of copper. You have a very unique country because you're the world's largest exporter of copper. I also show you this picture of Santiago. There is a plan that I believe can work where we can alleviate, slowly but surely, the smog of San Diego and the smog of every major city. There are a few components that take place, and the single biggest winner in this shift is you, the consumer, the worker, the student, the corporation, and your government. It's very important. The umbilical cord of human progress is energy and Chile is going to play a very important role. Thank you, everyone.